Hey there kids, it's me, Mr. Creepy Pasta, and I'm just going to tell you about one quick thing before we get started on tonight's story, and that's going to be about chilling. I talked to you guys about chilling before. Uh, it's an app that I do voice stuff for, so if you're used to listening to me here, uh, you can also listen to me tell stories that you don't hear here, uh, but they're ad-free on chilling. Chilling is also doing a giveaway. Giveaway is currently for a PS5, uh, so I know those are hard as shit to find. <laughs> if you guys want to get yourself a PS5, head over to chillingapp.com slash PS5, or I'm going to put the link in the description down below. All you got to do is start your free trial of chilling. I'll leave a review on the App Store or on Google Play, and then you complete that little survey that you see on the website. And you could win a PS5, you could win a whole bunch of chilling stickers and Ghosts of Tsushima for the PS5, which I have played, and I can tell you right now is absolutely worth the time to just start a trial and fill out a form. So, yeah. Check out Chilling, everybody. It's available for Apple, it's available for Android, it's available for everything. Check it out. It's got a free trial that you can use through the link in the description down below. And now, on to tonight's story. My grandmother has been catatonic for the last five years. On the night that Grandpa died, her neighbors called the police to come check on her. They said that she was screaming loud enough to be heard three houses down. And when the paramedics arrived, she had ruptured something in her throat. Grandpa was dead in the bed they shared. It was a heart attack. And as they zipped Grandpa into the black bag that would take him to the morgue, they carried Grandma out in a stretcher. After that, she wouldn't speak. She wouldn't move. She just lay in bed and stared at the ceiling of her room in the Shady Lane nursing home. My Grandma always was a strong lady. She was fed mechanically. She wears diapers that an orderly has to change. The physical exercise she gets comes in the form of a physical therapist, moving her legs for her as she lays in bed. If she leaves the room, it's because Denise or Reggie, the only two orderlies who seem to give a crap about the residents, lift her into her wheelchair and take her outside or to the resource room, which is really just a fancy word for the TV room. I begin my story this way so that you'll know how weird today's events were. I'm a 35-year-old father of two. I've been married since I was 27 to the love of my life. I thought that after eight years of marriage and raising children, nothing could get to me like it did today. I'm sitting at my computer with a bottle of scotch by my elbow and a sinking fear of returning to my marriage bed. It all started when I went to go visit my grandma today. So my family has a system. Mom and dad go to visit grandma on Monday. I go to visit on Wednesday, my little sister Lisa goes on Friday, and we all go to visit on Sunday after church. My wife doesn't go every time, but she comes with me sometimes. She's known Grandma since we were 17, and she remembers her before her current condition. She wasn't particularly close with Grandma, but I think that she likes to be there for me. You know? My Grandma and I have always been close. I love my Grandma, and I don't want to waste the time I might have left with her. Whether she knows I'm there or not. It's a thought that counts. Not over that much. I went on my lunch break today to see her. Reggie was there when I came in, and he gave me a big smile as he finished fussing with her pillows. It always warms my heart to see you and your sister coming to visit your old Graham, he said. He let me know how her vitals were, told me about the doctor visit that she'd had last week, and then he said that he'd leave us to our visit. Just me and my grandma... I took out my lunch, made some one-sided small talk as I ate. I read somewhere that coma patients are aware that someone's talking to them, and in some cases, it sometimes helped them come out of their coma. My grandma wasn't in a coma, no one really knew what was going on with grandma, but I like to think that maybe one day she'd come out of it and thank me for all the lovely visits. She'd say that it was my voice that had kept her going all these years. Pretty sure my sister just played on her phone the whole time that she was here. And I'd feel like I had helped Grandma in some way while she was going through this troubled time. Be careful what you wish for, I guess. I was just telling Grandma about a client I had helped at work when she suddenly inhaled sharply and exhaled in a rattling skeletal way. I paused, my hand still holding hers as it usually did. I was about to get Reggie, and suddenly the hand tightened spasmatically. She made another of those rattling breaths, her eyes rolling wildly. She was like a frightened horse looking for an escape. And though it was the middle of the day, I felt a cold chill run through me as she shuddered and gasped in pure terror. His hands, she breathed out, 
The hands of the dead. I pulled back suddenly, letting go of her clenched hand. Grandma, are you okay? Listen to me, I don't have much time, Bug. She was awake. Her face was pale and thin, her hands little more than fleshy claws, but she was awake. She was looking at me in that way that people look at fire exits in an inferno. And I tried to get up. She reached out again and took my hand in her cold, damp embrace. I wanted to get Reggie. Reggie would know what to do. But the naked want on her face held me in place. I knew I wasn't going anywhere. She'd called me Bug. That had always been her nickname for me. And when she said it, I realized how much I wanted to hear her say it again. Please, Bug, I need to tell you what he said. You need to know, she said frantically, almost pleading, and my knees set me down without thinking. This is what she told me. They had been in bed together when it happened. Both were at that advanced age where laying together was just that. The two were in bed, sleeping, just being with each other when Grandad's shuddering had woken her up. His arms had been around her, and her back had been against his front. I know from familiarity that this was how they'd always slept, since they were married at seventeen. The position was as natural as sleep itself. His shuddering had woken her up. His hands were grasping at me. His fingers were together like, like a pair of mittens, and he was opening and closing like slow pained machines. His mouth was against my ear, and his breath was raspy and panting. He sounded like he'd been running, and as he bucked around, I knew he must, he must have been having a heart attack. Your granddad's health hadn't been good for a while, but as I tried to break free of his arms, he held me tight, leaned his mouth in close. No, Ellie, don't go, please. I'm scared, Ellie, I'm scared, he said. And God help me, he sounded terrified. Don't be scared, Roy, I told him. You'll be okay. I'll call Dr. Stevens and he'll... I can't see, Ellie. That's what he said to me. I can't see, Ellie. They say you see the light or you hear a voice, but I can't see, Ellie. It's all black. It's all just black. And I can't see his face or hear his voice. He gripped me then hard. I felt his nails through my nightshirt, and as he did it, his heart, his heart attack was bad. I was terrified that he wouldn't come through this time. I tried to break free. I tried to get loose, but his arms were so rigid, I couldn't get away. The whole time he was just panting and telling me how there's nothing there and it's all just black and, and he knows, he knows there's nothing there. He kept right on repeating it even as his voice went out and then he leaned in close until his lips were on my ear and his, he breathed one final time. That was the first time I screamed. I screamed because I was in the arms of a dead man. He was gone, Bug. He breathed his last breath and that was that, but now I was caught in his last embrace. Her voice took on a tenuous, hysterical sound, and I remember thinking that somewhere a machine must be going off, somewhere telemetry must be telling someone how her heart was racing along too fast. Someone, somewhere, must be on their way with a crash cart or or a doctor, or a shot to calm her down, because in this room, she was so close to hysterics. I wanted to get that shot. As many times as I'd prayed to God to hear her speak again, I wanted to see that man come through the door with a shot, so that she would slip back off again. As much as I wanted her back, I knew this was not okay. At that moment, I wanted her back in her catatonic state. I wanted this jittery, hysterical creature out of pain. I pulled at his hands... Those strong hands that would take mine sometimes, and they were hands of stone. They'd locked in death, and now I couldn't separate them. His weight was a stone around me, and I was, I was afraid, Buck. I was afraid I'd never get loose, and they'd find us both 
dead right here. Him of a heart attack and me, a, a jest of plain old starvation. I... Her voice broke. And when she closed her hurting green eyes, I saw the tears spill out. I had to break his fingers. They sounded like dry twigs when they crack in the fire, and after I'd broken four of them, I almost had his hands apart. That's when he came back, she whispered, as though he might hear her. Her words made my blood run cold. He'd been dead for five minutes, Bug. His chest was close enough. I could feel nothing beating, but all of a sudden, his arms tightened around me, and he screamed into my ear like a wolf in a trap. He pulled me hard against him. I felt my ribs trying to break, and all of a sudden, he was bucking and thrashing like the devil himself had a hold of him. It burns! It burns, Ellie! He kept screaming and screaming it into my ear. When I finally thrust his hands apart, I rolled out of bed. I got as far from it as I could, and that's where they found me, Bug. They found me in the corner. They found me screaming. I don't know what was burning him, but I saw... I saw his last few minutes before he went out again. He writhed, he screamed, he died in agony. What kind of place had he been in that would make him scream like that, I thought. What kind of place, what kind of place, what kind of place? She kept right on mumbling that phrase again and again and again until I couldn't take it anymore. I got up, I walked out as fast as I could and I never looked back. I don't know what I'll do next time I have to see her. I didn't want to go back to work. I called my boss. I told him I wasn't feeling well. I needed to go home. And he let me. He's a good man. And when I called Reggie later that afternoon, he told me that she was right as rain as usual. When he'd given her her meds that afternoon, she was still lying in bed, staring at the ceiling as always. He never hinted at any change in telemetry. Never said a word about abnormal vitals, just told me how much he knew it meant to her that I came and visited. And now I'm sitting in my computer. I don't know what to do. I've been sitting here for about an hour and contemplated how I'll get on with the rest of my life, knowing my grandfather's agony and my grandmother's terror at the end of his life. I've been contemplating how I'm going to climb in bed with my wife tonight. A problem that seems to be more here and now. I see the thought of her wrapping her arms around me, placing her chest against my back, making me want to shudder right out of my skin. What would I do if she woke me up in the throes of a heart attack? What would I do if she whispered those same hopeless words into my ear before she died? What would I do if I found myself trapped in the embrace of my own dying love? Good evening once again, kids. It's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and I want to tell you thank you for watching tonight's video, or for listening to tonight's episode of the podcast that's available on Spotify, or on Apple Music or on uh, um, any any other places that you can get podcasts. I'm not I'm not entirely sure where people listen to podcasts. Uh, if you guys are watching on YouTube, though, I would really appreciate if you click the subscribe button, click that thumbs up button, and hit the bell for me, because that's what we're supposed to say now. We're required by YouTube law. As always, I want to give a big thank you to all of my supporters on Patreon. You guys are the real MVPs, and you allow us to get a whole bunch of custom stories that are only heard here on this channel, on this podcast. So, a very big thank you to Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Stephanie Butler, Bobby Carmen, Tristan Pelton, Chase Burnett, Diana Krause, Maria Walker, Tanya Oren, Payne Gravy, Inactive Hermit, 
Austin Johnson, Crazy Kid, Mr. Marcus Blitz, Aka Limchok, Dirt Diver 030, Matt Bach, Jabbles Raz, Voice of Sand, Coffee Zombie, Matthew McNeese, Chelly J, Jeremy H, Raltazal, Ficomel, Nana, The Morgan, Nick Weaver, Melted Lake, Tali Sue, Sky Maria Ravenswood, William King, Reaper 61167, Darth Miver, Micah Ortiz, Satanic Ares, Nessie, Parafa Panda, Bardo Hawk 764, Lambda M98, Harley, Billy Morrow, Sashi Suzaku, My Body Sounds Like Rice Krispies, Miss Xander, Suji Campbell, Stricken, Azarine Fox, Freddy Krueger, Happy Birthday Jason Wilson, Lisa Cottrell, Caspian, Hades Nephew, Tater Chip, Acid System, Prozac and Pancake Appreciation Society, Cryptic Nightmares, Kiri the Sloth, Tommy Green, Fester's Lampshade, Sky Harbor, Nico Kyle, Rafael Rodriguez, The Ginger Bros, Aaron Stormcrow, Daniel Polson, Trey Smiles, and Corey Kenshin. And of course, everybody who's down there in the description as well, and everybody who can support on patreon.com slash mrcreepypasta for even one dollar, I appreciate it greatly, and I'm sure that all the authors that we were able to work with appreciate it too. So, thank you guys so much, thank you for listening, and sweet dreams.